Our first speaker is Dr. Jason Chow. Dr. Chow is an obstetrician, gynecologist and pain special and will be speaking on all about pelvic pain. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you to Sespin for inviting me to speak. And thank you all for sharing some of your lockdown time. I hope uh, the practices haven't been too crazy trying to work things through um, by telehealth. I've certainly had my fair share of uh, patients trying to describe their vulvas by phone, uh, which uh, is not very easy. Uh, but tonight's not really just about what we traditionally think about from a gynecology point of view, but it is more about this idea of chronic pelvic pain. And one of the things that uh, I often get asked uh, by the patient or by uh, the referrers is what is the cause of this pain? And often it gets whittled down uh, uh, to two things uh, traditionally, to endometriosis or PID. And the problem with this sort of model is it's quite reductionist and it doesn't really cater for all the anatomical issues that arise from the pelvis. There's certainly more to the pelvis than uh, just endometriosis and just the uterus and adnexa and the ovaries. And there's certainly more to the pelvis also um, in terms of musculoskeletal and somatic nerve uh, based issues and other organs as well. But most importantly, I think that model which confines to the viscera doesn't fit with our models of understanding of chronic pain when we look at any other condition, including the ones we're looking at tonight, like chronic back pain, chronic neck pain, um, ideas that we see things like fibromyalgia or even chronic headache patients. And our dear president, our current president of the college, um, uh, espouses the, the, the confusion with this sort of issue. Um, this was a non-peer-reviewed, our non-peer-reviewed quarterly uh, uh, journal that comes out to uh, uh, the uh, diploma and the uh, fellows of our college. Um, and this was two years ago, there was an article or an issue around pelvic pain. And you can see in his introduction, he describes pelvic pain as being synonymous with endometriosis. Um, but I wanna to put to you, and I'm going to put this out early. This is not a talk about endometriosis. We know that women who have endometriosis, um, even if they have surgery, um, up to 50% of patients will have ongoing pain. About 20% of patients don't have any reduction in pain. And regardless of whether you use medical or surgical treatments, about a third of patients will have ongoing symptoms after you cease treatment. We also know that the amount of endometriosis have doesn't correlate with pain and that with repeat surgeries, there's less value from a pain management or a functional improvement point of view. And so the other thing I wanna to put to you is this idea that um, we've looked at, and you hear a lot from our colleagues, that surgery is the answer for endometriosis. And I hope you probably see this in your practice, that this is probably something that we were thinking about probably more in the 90s and noughties, and hopefully we're moving on from that uh, thinking, although it is practiced probably by a lot of uh, our colleagues um, and definitely has some validity, but I want to put to you that a lot of the evidence that we have for the benefit of, of treating endometriosis by surgery um, comes from very small studies. So yes, there is a risk reduction, as you can see, but it's only based on 170 patients over three randomized trials. And two of those trials only looked at six months of follow-up for the patients. And um, there's a World Endometriosis uh, um, a Conference that we are not attending uh, this year in person, but um, uh, is being housed in Scotland. And uh, Andrew Horn, who is one of the authors of this paper last year, put the question out there to gynecologists saying, you know, should we be really putting everything down to surgery? Because all the rest of the evidence we have outside those randomized controlled trials is based on really observational data or cohort sort of started studies. So we're basing a lot of stuff on some small level two evidence. Just to put out there, you know, endometriosis varies quite a bit in appearance. Here you see several types of endometriosis. Um, uh, you can see here on the bottom right, uh, the uterosacral supporting ligaments to the uterus with some endometriotic lesions. You see on the top right, um, a fenestration or a pulling in with scarring based on endometriosis. But, and you see over here, this is stage four endometriosis where the bowel and everything is stuck together behind the uterus. So you can certainly see here, the top of the uterus here, the bowel is stuck here, the right tube just barely being seen. But a patient like this who has stage four endometriosis often doesn't actually have um, a, a, a lot of pain and the patient um, with the smaller lesions might have pain. And really this comes down to the way we look at um, uh, uh, our understanding about pain. And a lot of the things that we get taught about as you'll hear tonight is an acute pain model. Uh, Rene Descartes, 
um, lend his name to this Cartesian model um, where we say that if you have pain and you identify the location and what is causing the pain, you can, in this circumstance, take your foot out of the fire and get rid of that pain. And it's a very simplistic single, you can see a line or anatomy that takes the um, source of the pain up to the brain and that is it. But we know, and you see this day in, day out with patients like chronic back pain and so forth, that that is a very simplistic model to understand chronic pain. And if we apply that pelvic pain model to endometriosis, endometriosis lesions alone, we're missing the point. And so the objective tonight is to not just think about things from a anatomical cause point of view, but also understand really the mechanisms of pain. So you're not treating causes, but you're treating the mechanisms. And this then takes your thinking to be about just finding single diagnostic causes, which yes, has a point. And yes, you do need to rule out the important things like cancer. You do need to rule out endometriosis and infections and acute causes. But when is it related more to multiple mechanisms? Using these mechanisms to then give the basis to your management with your patient. I also want to lend uh, to the idea that there are specific causes that are outside the viscera that are worthwhile considering. And tonight we're talking about some of the peripheral neuralgias, uh, somatic uh, nerves that can cause pain in the pelvis and perineum. Um, there are other areas like musculoskeletal areas that we're, we're not talking about tonight, but I'm happy to field questions about. And I think one of the best ways to show this is to just give you a few case examples. Now, for if you've heard my talks about this before, you might uh, get bored and if you're sitting with a glass of wine, fall asleep, thinking about these ideas about mechanisms and neurobiology. But you can see from the right-hand side of my screen, a lot of the things that I think about is uh, related to not just confined to the pelvis, but sort of a brain, spinal cord, neurobiology and neurotransmitter type model. So it really is a systemic sort of model of things that we're thinking about. And I think that's one of the concepts I wanna try and introduce and I've talked about before is this idea of convergence. So we see that there is a visceral, visceral convergence, which means that women who have pain in one visceral organ often have functional or pain-based issues in other organs as well, because of these changes that happen at a central spinal cord and neurotransmitter level. And this is why we often see a crossover with women who have endometriosis, bladder pain, IBS, chronic thrush, We've all given them somatic names and they have somatic bases, but they have an association which is uh, often uh, clustered with these functional disorders. We also see a convergence from a viscerosomatic point of view. For example, we see that a lot of women with endometriosis also have back pain or pelvic girdle pain. And interestingly, there was a study that was done, uh, I think last year, in the last year, that uh, showed that a lot of women who present with back and girdle pain often have a history of incontinence. So we often have this sort of functional overlap between pain and functional symptoms as well. And the other big concept I want to introduce is this idea about descending inhibition. And this is the ability of the brain and the sensitivity and these afferent, these ascending influences coming from the peripheries that are giving pain information and modulate how much attention or how much effect it has on the person. And this is particularly relevant because we see a big um, a percentage of our patients uh, suffering trauma, we often find that in a pelvic pain sort of service, half to two thirds of patients have a history of trauma. And as you know, the baseline sort of rate is more around uh, a quarter of the population. So they're overrepresented in this sort of setting. And we often see that patients in chronic pain, but particularly this sort of pelvic pain background, have a lot of personality traits, a lot of vulnerable presentations. And often when you take the history, they have a big developmental history around that sort of prejudicial upbringing and early parentification and that sort of issue. Not all patients, but you often see there's a bit of a pattern around that and the ability for them to help manage their pain and to cope. So I'm gonna put to you that when we think about these mechanisms and not about causes, that pelvic pain is not pelvic. And I'll give you a few specific examples. Again, looking at this idea of visceral, visceral hyperalgesia, we know that pain begets pain. We know, for example, that for women who have IBS, if that is managed, often the dysmenorrhea improves. We know that women have had endometriosis in the past have improvement in their functional symptoms, including their urgency and their incontinence. We know that women who've had kidney stones treated have improvement in the period pain. And this really nice study, which you may have heard me talk about before, um, is looking at women who have period pain, not endometriosis, but period pain versus women who don't have period pain. And if you did some unpleasant heat testing on their deltoids. So you put a, something hot 
at a standardized level on their shoulder, women who have had a history of period pain in their life will feel pain at a lower level of heat than women who have not had period pain in their life. And it, obviously your shoulder is in a completely different part of your body to your pelvis. And that is reflecting these central mechanisms to pain. And I want to put to you, therefore, that pain is the issue, not what's in your pelvis, not endometriosis. Another nice study was done a few years ago that used that functional MRI to compare the brain centers that light up with women who have chronic pelvic pain. And what you see is that women who have chronic pelvic pain with or without endometriosis have very similar centers light up in their brain. And the women who have endometriosis but no pain actually have protective factors around the descending inhibition centers. This also fits with the current ICD-11 classification that puts chronic pelvic pain as a primary issue. And so they talk about this sort of pain syndrome as a group of, of, of disorders. Um, but what we're trying to see is that this is a, um, a primary uh, pain issue as opposed to a symptom of a cause. So let's put that into practice. And one of the things that I often find is that uh, GPs are best suited to be able to work this out with their patients, to have a look at this uh, mechanism-based management because you have a good longitudinal relationship with the patient. By and large, and I think this will change, but it will be generational. When you refer to a gynecologist, a lot of the issues are looked at from an acute Cartesian point of view and from a surgical point of view. And surgery may not serve the patient's best interest. Now, I know you know that not all gynecologists overoperate and operate, but you certainly uh, probably have come across many a patient who has had multiple surgeries without improvement. GP is also better able to, with your longitudinal issue, validate the patient's pain. They will still have pain even though they may have negative scans and negative uh, ultrasounds and negative laparoscopies. There's an opportunity to describe and understand these sort of issues that we're talking about tonight. Important to be able to identify not causes, but things that will flare up pain. And these may not necessarily be physical ones every time. They might be stress related, they might be emotion related, and that's not to say that they're the causes of pain. Um, still got to validate the causes of pain and the mechanisms of pain. Um, and you can also therefore triage out and explore that true sort of psychosocial biomedical management rather than just the biomedical alone. The other role that the GP may have in support with uh, maybe a specialist is to um, answer that question around fertility, which is often equated with pain for women and it's important to be able to pick that out a little bit. And we'll talk a bit about that in one of the case examples tonight. So I'm gonna to talk to you about this lady, Natalia. She's 18 and she's had pelvic pain for a long time. And in fact, over the last couple of years, the pain's been getting into menstrual or non-menstrual and it's worse when she poos and it's worse when she's sexually active. It sometimes lasts for hours or days after she has sex. When she has the urge to defecate, she gets the same sort of pelvic pain. And then sometimes that pain lasts for an hour or two after she actually does um, uh, open her bowels. She's had previous endometriosis diagnosed by laparoscopy. In fact, she had a laparoscopy with a uh, reputable gynecology surgeon two years ago when she was 16. And um, he said, you know, you probably have had endo for several years and didn't know about it. And she's at the stage where she's come saying, I want another laparoscopy. Because the last one helped me. It helped me for about four months and I was better. Now, what's going on for Natalia? Well, you know her because you've looked after her a while. She's got a history of trauma. So she's a, um, her parents immig um, immigrated to Australia. And um, she came here when she was four. Um, she had a family member um, uh, uh, sexually abuse her when she was younger. Um, and she sees a psychologist for that that's psychotherapy. Her sleep is disturbed. She, her pain is worse, certainly, around the time of a period or before a period. We talked about her, how um, her bowel also triggers pain. She's always had dysmenorrhea from the time of menarche, so from the time of 11, she's always had painful periods. And there's a couple of things that have put her out of whack. So she's doing her HSC this year. And it's been harder because she's had to go on and off on, uh, to online learning. She hasn't been able to access her normal resources. She's running late to try and fit in one of her assessments and the trials are coming up. Big flares in pain. She's landed in emergency actually last week where they said to her, your ultrasound's normal. Um, you're not gonna get a laparoscopy through emergency. You can have some morphine while you're in and go home. 
So how do we how do we look after Natalia? Well, the first thing is to do is to, to, to take on board all that bit of a history and understand where she's coming from. One thing she's really worried about is that she's not going to be able to get through her current assessments and assignments and her trials upcoming. And also that she's really, really worried about is my endo coming back? And what's this going to mean for my future fertility health? And am I going to have kids? And all these questions are coming to the fore. Now, when I examine these patients, apart from just doing the normal gynecological assessment, I also want to look for signs of allodynia. So I actually run a tissue or a condom bud over the abdomen, and I also run over the, a condom bud over the uh, vestibule or the vulva. And when you touch the vulva, she jumps. She's sore. And when you do a single digit, a single finger examination, you can feel that the pelvic floor is very tight and overactive and very sore. And these type of patients, when you put a speculum in, it's very hard to open the speculum sometimes, very hard to sometimes visualize. And we say, you know, the cervix is tipped backwards and so forth. But actually, sometimes the issue is the, is the outlet is overactive, which makes it difficult to, 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 do, to do an assessment. Now, you send her along for an ultrasound. She's even had a deep endometriosis ultrasound, and that's normal. There's no deep endo. We know that we can't rule out superficial endometriosis. But we know from her presentation, there's a little bit more to the picture. And one of the big ones is hope is starting to set that uh, 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 understanding that yes, endometriosis is an issue, but this is um, may not necessarily be the, 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 the cause of her pain at this stage. And there may be other ways to help manage it. We do know there's a cycle basis to her pain. So there may be a role to look at hormonal management and anything that's going to help suppress cycle and keep hormones even is going to be important. The other aspect of things is that some of these women have a higher crossover of being progestin intolerant, that is intolerant to synthetic uh, progestins. And one of the issues with that is that they don't often tolerate things like uh, the usual pills, in particular that group of pills like the uh, sort of diantiasmins, um, uh, 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 that sort of uh, generation uh, are often worse for the mood. So um, for these women sometimes, and it may not be possible for Natalia in this acute setting, or subacute setting, but um, sometimes a myorena because it's lower dose may help. Although when you're very flared, putting a myorena as an outpatient can sometimes be sensitizing and very challenging. And particularly if she's not actually been sexually active, a patient's not been sexually active, that may not be possible. I do find some of the newer generation uh, hormones, so stuff like uh, uh, Zoeli um, and uh, the Nuvering can also be helpful. And they're also quite good at achieving amenorrhea because you can skip periods better with a lower rate of breakthrough bleeding. So that could be an option as well. And any, it's not so much the... Uh, the cycle suppression as much as also the breakthrough bleeding, which can often be a trigger for pain as well. So to be able to achieve that can be important. For someone who has sexual pain is particularly an issue, you can use topical amitriptyline, but it unfortunately is compounded, so maybe out of reach for cost. Um, there's a couple of formulations for this. I um, often find Versa base as a formulation is quite a good one. Some women um, find Organogel is a good one. Um, Sleep is a particular issue for her, and she does have some urinary symptoms. So you might want to try a low dose oral tricycle if she's not on any other SSRI or other serotonin agent. You'd have to sell it to her and understand that this is not um, just for acute pain, and also that um, uh, uh, using a low dose of a, a tricycle is not for depression per se. And there's a role also around very specific physiotherapy. So the idea is to also keep that theme around education. Um, but you want to look at more pelvic floor down training and understand those triggers and learn how to uh, turn off some of that uh, protective responses and pain responses that are related uh, to the pelvis. Um, a, a good pelvic pain physiotherapist will also go through bowel management and may also help manage some of the straining and issues that uh, someone like Natalia may have with uh, dyskesia. Um, there's specific roles to do specific procedures, obviously not necessarily for Natalia, but sometimes to do fancy stuff, so Botox to the pelvic floor, it's a muscle relaxant, but that's not necessarily something you want to do in the acute setting. Um, and the other big thing with the education, she has a psychotherapist, and it's often good to explore that bi-directional relationship between pain and stresses as well. And it's not just about the trauma per se and rehashing that stuff, but giving some active strategies to help manage and recognise the build-up to that pain, you know, when you've got poor pacing, when you um, overdoing things, when the stresses are high, how do you improve your self-care and the preventative and to have insight into um, uh, what these things are going to trigger. So um, in the interest of time, I'll quickly go through this, but um, you know, um, there is some, uh, I find that nortriptyline and there is some studies around this for chronic pelvic pain tends to be a little bit better tolerated for young women than amitriptyline. Um, and usually I start really low. So we're talking like at half a, a 10 milligram tablet and going up by five or 10 milligrams every week to maybe even only 20 or 30 milligrams for a young woman. Anything above 50 milligrams is really for, uh, for depressant doses rather than for pain itself. Gabapentin may also have a role. You've got to be careful around the dependence issues with those as well. 
Likewise, you start pretty low, maybe at 100 milligrams at night and build up by 100 milligrams every five to seven days. And you only probably need about 600 to 1,000 milligrams divided over TDS dosing. So maybe like 200 morning, 200 lunch, three to 400 at night to get a reasonable trial to see how these women go. Geloxotene can be good uh, for uh, chronic pelvic pain as well, maybe good, helpful for the anxiety, but as you know, it's difficult with withdrawal. We really try not to start an opioid for these women. And a third of these women are starting an opioids by gynecologists um, or through that ED setting. So having some education around that's gonna be really important and to put some contracts around that. As you know, there's a lot more restrictions around this as well, which makes it harder. Uh, every second patient asks about cannabinoids. It has biological plausibility. We don't have the data for it yet. It may be trial, but as you know, if you get it uh, through uh, medical resources, it's quite expensive. The other important thing is that all these patients ask, you know, about their worry about endo. And I think to answer that question where endo can only definitely be diagnosed by surgery, we have to ask, is surgery warranted if you get better or if you manage your pain better without doing this? And there might be harm um, with potentially doing uh, surgery in that it can be a sensitizing event and can psychologically lead to disappointment if there isn't the um, uh, uh, anticipated outcome from the surgery itself. Some women end up with worse pain after surgery. And the other issue that we talk about is about fertility and what you'd hope that a lot of the gynecologists that do surgery now will be able to give their patients and you an idea about their endometriosis fertility index and their state of endo, and therefore what the effects are gonna be on their fertility. And it's important not to exaggerate that. And you'll find a lot of um, our colleagues will talk about severe endo, but to actually stage it well and actually see it doesn't involve the ovaries and the annexa. And I put to you that if your deep endometriosis ultrasound is negative and there's no ovarian disease, you're probably less likely there's going to be fertility impacts uh, with that alone. And probably on average, about a lower stage endo, about 70% of women will be able to fall pregnant. It might take them one to two years, but uh, it's as in longer than a, a couple. But um, if they've got superficial endo, it's less likely to have those sort of effects on fertility. So the other thing in short, the time that we have is not to forget about peripheral neurologists. And the two that I wanted to particularly talk about is the iliohypogastric and iliinguinal sort of nerves, um, which are commonly seen after cesarean section, and also the pedendal nerve, which can be seen after um, obstetric based trauma or after birth, even without trauma, and particularly with some women with particular physical influence. So, briefly, another case example is Susan, who's had it eight weeks after a seizure, she's got left lower abdominal pain. Um, she's been through ED twice and the hospital, the gynecology team at the hospital have recommended she have a laparoscopy and potentially take out the annexa uh, because there's pain, even though there's no pathology on ultrasound. And one of the salient features of this is that this lady, whenever she um, uh, contracts her abdominal wall, gets pain. So when she goes upstairs, gets into the car, carries her son on the, and uh, she carries her son on the same side, uh, she gets a lot of pain. And she had quite a difficult recovery. She remembers as soon as the um, spinal anesthetic worn off, she had a burning neuropathic sounding pain in the lower abdomen over the wound and never got better. And she had high echo requirements for two weeks after her cesarean section. And when you examine her, she's got a positive trendelenburg sign. So the hip uh, tilts when you stand up on one leg. She has contip alandinia of the, um, over the distribution of the iliohypogastric nerve. So around that sort of lower scar and it's only unilateral. And also when you put a finger on the lateral rectus border, it's quite tender. And so this is someone, if you pick up in the first three months after uh, they get a neuropathic pain, you could resolve it before it becomes chronic. So she might just benefit from having an iliohypogastric block or going on to some sort of neuropathic agent. So you could use a topical neuropathic agent, it have to be compounded, uh, something like the Nervidum Versatis patches, or you might also look at a low dose of something which is a bit more neuropathic, but you've got to weigh that up with a woman breastfeeding and with their sleep, but you know, certainly tricyclic and pentero K in low doses, even in a breastfeeding setting. Um, there may also be a role from a physiotherapy point of view to prevent that uh, turn on the abdominal wall. And that might also be addressing some of the pelvic girdle asymmetry, which often comes with about 30 to 40% of women with pregnancy and persists afterwards. Again, it's important to validate the causes of pain for Susan and to understand the issues that she has with breastfeeding, keep an eye out for her mental health in this sort of setting after a first child at that two month period postpartum, is she getting sleep? How is her mood? Um, last example is Katrin. Uh, she's 52 and she's had new onset vaginal pain and is no longer to have had sex. And one of the stories with her is that um, her pain is particularly worse with sitting and relieved when she lies down, not present other times. 
And it's, it's, she's, she's a keen cyclist and now she's been reducing her work into what's retirement um, and uh, been cycling more. Uh, she's uh, not been able to cycle anymore. And that's where a lot of her social activities have um, been marked. And when you examine her, she's got with economy, but allodynia over one labia. And she's also got very uh, sore pelvic floor again on one side. And when you palpate the ischial spine at the back of the pelvis uh, lightly, it's sore. So this is someone who might have a pedendal neuralgia. And one of the subset causes of pedendal neuralgia is nerve entrapment. But nerve entrapment is a very small subset of all patients with neuralgia. She would also benefit from pedendal uh, nerve-based pelvic pain physiotherapy, not turning on the pelvic floor, but learning how to let it go, learning how to uh, 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 not uh, turn on the pedendal nerve. She may benefit from oral neuropathic pharmacotherapy. She may also benefit from specific interventions like a pedendal block. Um, and for a very, very small subset of patients, they end up having you know, release surgeries and all this sort of stuff that we um, talk about at some of these talks. But often, I, I give an idea, we probably do release surgery, and I, I get intake from nationally from patients, um, probably about three times to five times a year uh, maximum at the moment. So um, it's only a very small number of women. So this is um, when we do the laparoscopic uh, robotic surgery. You can see the nerve here and the ligament, the sacred spine ligament has been cut to release that nerve. Again, only for a minority of patients that would do something like that. So neuromodulation, again, for a vast minority of patients. And again, it's that question around validating Catherine's pain because it won't show up necessarily on a scan. And certainly it's something like a hysterectomy will not be helpful in this sort of circumstance. And I've certainly seen women with neuropathic or visceral hyperalgesia central pain after over-operating, including with hysterectomies. So I hope tonight that I've been able to show you that it's not just about naming causes in the pelvis for pain. It is important to recognize non-visceral causes like peripheral nerves, like musculoskeletal causes, but most important is to understand the mechanisms and look at all the inputs, the true psychosocial biomedical model to managing pain. And I'll quickly flip through um, some resources and they can be sent out to you guys as well. Um, I find that this online course from Macquarie Uni really helpful called MindSpot. They do stuff for well-being generally and anxiety and depression, but they've got a good one for pain um, and it's not uh, expensive. There's some resources from our college around endometriosis, but it does understand a lot about pain management rather than endo itself. Uh, the Faculty of Pain Medicine also has some uh, guides around helping support you around how to uh, make opioid contracts, put uh, boundaries on opioids, but also where opioids may um, be uh, useful in a measured way. Um, there's a QR code for that one. Um, and this one uh, coming across when I was updating my reading for this round of talks um, is a really nice summary that was published in JMO and is available, um, I think, online, or I can also send you out the link as well which unwraps uh, some of the stuff that I've been talking about if you've got a spare moment to read. So I hope um, I've given you a bit of an insight into that bigger picture uh, of the impression, so to speak, uh, rather than concentrating on all the individual brush strokes. And with the bigger picture, you'll have a better understanding, a better partnership uh, with the women you are uh, caring for. Thanks very much for your Thank you. Uh, the first question is, is hypogastric plexus block useful in chronic pelvic pain? Mm. I think that the, the data doesn't show it is, but we have little data to measure it. I think that um, it can be useful for some patients, and I think particularly in a cancer pain setting with visceral pain. But as you can see from the uh, picture around the mechanisms, because the mechanisms are often central for that chronic pelvic pain aspect of things, um, uh, a hypogastric block really only blocks some pathways. Um, they, a few years ago, like in the 90s, we looked at doing um, hypogastric uh, sort of nerve resections, essentially, or nerve ablations to treat endometriosis-related pain, and we found it didn't work. And it makes sense because, as we've seen, those mechanisms are much more uh, spinal cord brain descending inhibition based. That's not to say that they do work for a select number of patients, but it certainly wouldn't be my first go-to uh, for all patients, it's probably uh, the vast minority of patients who benefit from that. And again, it comes down to thinking about the mechanism. So if you've got someone who actually has more pelvic girdle or more, um, uh, say, a peripheral somatic nerve-based pain, obviously it's not going to help. But for that type of patient, I imagine you're talking about that, that chronic pelvic pain, uh, visceral hypogesia type patient, um, it uh, probably works in a minority of, uh, of, of people. 
Okay, uh, we have another question. Are there any longitudinal associations between patient trauma and chronic pain sensitivity? Yeah, so there's actually some really um, good uh, data around that. So it's not just the observational stuff that we see more trauma patients, um, but we often see that um, there's a crossover in their neurobiology when you look at it from a mechanism point of view. Um, so when they look at functional MRI studies, for example, and they do sort of common pain testing, the mechanisms are very similar. Um, we also see that women have had trauma at a um, at any time in their life, but particularly, you know, if you look at your developmental history around your chronic pain, um, for a lot of women, um, the stuff, the descending inhibition, the ability to soothe develops through your teen years into your early 20s. So if you throw in trauma and you throw in period pain in that time, you don't really give that descending inhibition a chance to grow. Um, and um, often then you learn these sort of maladaptive coping as well from that point of view. So we often see that women have had trauma, particularly early in life, um, uh, have issues around that. The other avenue, not just from a neurobiology point of view, is to look at it from that um, a coping sort of strategy point of view. And often you find there's a lot of um, similarities around um, vulnerabilities, um, lack of validation, difficult therapeutic relationships, um, sort of very passive coping strategies and avoidance, fear avoidance and things like that, that typify women who've had, or men and women actually, who've had trauma before, doesn't have to be sexual alone, um, as well as with um, pain. And um, on that note, not that this is a, a, an extrapolation of your question, uh, but you know, women have had surgical trauma, so they might have had a complication or they've had worse pain after surgery, often have more challenges. Um, that itself is a traumatic event, but often when you look at it, there's a high representation of women who've had trauma in that sort of setting. So I'm thinking about uh, women, for example, who've had um, some of the mesh pain stuff. And that's not to say all these women have had sexual abuse before, uh, but that itself is a traumatic event. And that is the big missing pitch. And when I hear my colleagues talk about um, surgical trauma and pain um, and focusing on removing mesh and doing nerve blocks and things like that, that is important, but it's not actually the big picture about how do you build coping strategies and adaptive coping strategies in this setting where the pain is probably going to be chronic. Okay, I think that's all we have for you at the moment. So we might go on with Dr. James Yu. So thank you very much, Dr. Chow. And thank you. thank you for your time. Okay. Dr. James Yu is an interventional pain specialist and will be speaking on non-pharmacological management of chronic pain. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Hi, everyone. Thank you for logging in. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, uh, sessions and today's talk uh, I'm, I'm covering non-pharmacological management of chronic pain is a very wide topic I hope I can cover as much uh, pain condition and, and, and management option in this uh, 25 minute session uh, but if you want any of you want to discuss about different kind of management options that we can open up during the the, the question time uh, without further delay I'll so a, a lot of us has uh, quite a few chronic pain patients and we know that they are very complex patient and they, they're very time consuming and they usually suffers, you know, not just a, a pain, uh, high pain intensity, but it, if a patient has chronic pain for many years, you can see that they also suffer from physical, mental, emotional and social dysfunction. So by providing just a pharmacological management treatment, which is what we call monotherapy, we know that for, for this type of complex patient, it does not work. So in, in our multidisciplinary pain center, we advocate a multimodal multidisciplinary approach. Uh, these are the five pillars of, of, of the common pain management approach that I utilize in our pain service. So the non-pharmacology treatment that we, we usually recommend, is, I think the first is patient education, to tell them about acute pain and chronic pain, nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and various uh, management option. We also utilize uh, psychological and physical therapies uh, help to improve their mental and physical function. And also we provide uh, minimal in invasive intervention or procedures to reduce the pain intensity for six months or 12 months, then they can actually embark on uh, re physical rehabilitation, improve their physical and mental function. I'm not saying that all the patients that we get referred will have to undergo all these full gamut of the, the five pillars of, of pain management. Some patient might be quite simple with, with back pain due to some arthritis. Uh, we just offer some uh, simple procedure and physical therapy and the patient gets better. 
um, but more complex patients will need all the full gamuts of this management option. So in our multidisciplinary pain clinic across uh, uh, Sydney and Darlinghurst, Randwick and, and Cogra and Hurstville area, we advocate a comprehensive uh, assessment, not just on their pain intensity and, and the site of the pain, but we also look into the, the physical function, the day-to-day -day activities, and, and also assess their psychological and social function to see if they're able to, to go to work or, or, or they're able to get out of the house and, and assess whether are they depressed or, or anxious. And then we can advocate all, all, all the various treatment options. We also optimize the analgesia. We, we tell them the chronic uh, use of uh, opioid medication, high dose, long-term use, can cause dependency, and, and we want to look into a more non-opioids or, or opioid rotation to a less addictive medication and, and embark on more empty neuropathic medication uh, for chronic pain. Uh, one special part of our, our service is a, a minimal invasive procedures we carry out to, to a lot of our patients, uh, which involves a lot of diagnostic blocks. Sometimes we get referred from GP or even neurosurgeon to do some diagnostic block in the cervical spine or lumbar spine to see whether if their pain is arising from the, the pain generators. If the patient has a good diagnostic block, then we uh, pursue a radiofrequency ablation for the patient to, 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 to provide them with a prolonged pain relief. Uh, our procedures is a bit different from the radiologists where we don't use a CD scan uh, to do our procedures, means it, it will uh, exert less radiation. So if the patient would need three or four uh, uh, injection a year, we think using a less uh, 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 fluoroscopy with less radiation will probably be the, the be better way to go. Uh, and even with fluoroscopy, we can carry on some live uh, fluoroscopy. We can see the needle advancement with very, very uh, little radiation. And also we treat the patient's symptoms. We correlate our symptoms with the scans. And we always tell the patient, even though your scan shows all these changes, but it does not correlate with the symptoms. So we don't treat the scan. And in some patient who is an elderly, who has multi-level uh, degenerative changes, we can actually offer multi-level both side, a uh, lot of levels at the same setting to save them from going back to have this, uh, other procedures on other levels in, in different setting. Some, some of patients are, are also quite anxious and quite stressed and, and, and we can offer them some sedation in a day surgery setting. And the good thing is we also assess the patient two weeks to six weeks after the procedure to see whether the pain is improved. If the pain is improved, we're able to reduce uh, the opioid analgesia on other me pain medication and then refer them to physio and OTs to improve their physical function. So I just wanna share with you a few pain conditions I see a lot in my clinic. Back pain again is, is probably the most common pain condition I see. And because we, you know, at least 50% of, of the patient that I see in my clinic are, are because of back pain. In the younger population, back pain is mostly due to muscular issues or muscular ligamentous issue. But when we get older and you can see in the chart, when you reach 50, 60, even 70 or 80, the arthritis or degenerative changes become a more prominent feature of, of the back pain. And the most common cause of the uh, XL back pain will be a facet joint arthritis followed by uh, discopity or, 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 or disc degeneration. Very small amount of patients suffers from vertebral body or, or, or end plate pain. So we've been treating facet joint arthropathy in a lumbar spine and cervical spine for you know, at least 10 years. And we're getting very good at it by diagnosing with a physical function, a physical examination and, 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 and scan. I think the, the best um, scan to, 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 to diagnose facet joint arthropathy would be either CD scan or bone scan or uh, MRI. You can see in the four diagrams here, facet joint arthropathy is best diagnosed in, on the Excel card. You can see grade one, you have joint uh, space narrowing. Uh, grade two will be narrowing with a bit of sclerosis. And, the, and when it's advanced, you can also see sclerosis and, and, and osteophytes form, formation. And the X, sorry, the sagittal uh, view is also would be very helpful to, to, to diagnose facet joint arthropathy. You can see uh, at L5 S1 this is collapse, putting the facet joint a bit closer to each other. And you can see the L45 and L5 S1 facet joint on the right side, they're all narrowed with, with osteophyte formation. We can also perform a bone scan with SPEC CT to, to see if the patient has multiple levels of 
arthropathy. Bone scan can single out which levels is the hot spot and, a, a, and you can see increased uptake uh, on, on this is probably an alpha S1 on the right side. So we have to be uh, careful to see, look at a uh, bone scan to make sure the increased uptake is at the posterior segment, which is the in the facet joint rather than in the anterior segment at the disc. So if the, the increased uptake is in the anterior segment, this patient will be suffering from more disco vertebra uh, condition and not facet joint problem. So how do we treat facet joint? As I said, we have been, you know, we, we treat, we, we see facet joint problem in a lumbar spine, at least, you know, 30 to 40 patient a week. And we've been uh, fine tuning our technique and, and, and master the art of, of treating this facet joint pain. So we find that a, a, a technique called radio frequency ablation works really well for patients with a, a facet joint pain. Uh, and this patient are usually axial back pain, has no radical leg pain. And if, if the patient only has facet joint problem, radio frequency ablation on, we have to, for one facet joint, we have targeted to two nerves. You can see we have to target the nerve, the middle branch nerve above and the middle branch nerve below to, to, to cover the whole one facet joint. So in the past, when this procedure was started, they, uh, people were using radio frequency needle that is small and, and in a perpendicular fashion to the nerve. But over the last five years, uh, uh, we are using a bigger needle, placing the needle in a parallel fashion to the nerve. And we find that we are getting better results because the thermal of co coagulation of the nerve is, is in, in, in a, a wider area. Then we can actually provide pain relief for at least uh, 12 months instead of just four to five months. So the patients are very happy and, and sometimes the patient can get pain relief for 12 months or, or 15 months and, and we only see them once a year. And, and if you're suffering from multi-level uh, facet joint arthropathy, some, sometimes when you refer to the patients refer to neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons are, are quite reluctant to do multi-level fusion because of the age of the patient. So this is probably the best technique. Uh, we, we carry out these procedures with a fluoroscopy, uh, usually starts with with a little bit oblique to look at the, the Scotty dog view. And the meter branch nerves are quite consistent. And we place our needle, as I said, in a parallel fashion to, to the, to the uh, meter branch nerve. And we confirm it with two, at least two or three views to make sure that the needle is advanced in, uh, in not too far to, to, into the neuroforamen area, but enough to, to, to cause coagulation of a good length of the meter branch nerves. So one, uh, I see a lot of patients, I just want to share a, a few patients with you. Most of our patients are above 60 years old who are suffering from facet joint arthropathy. Uh, this lady who has had a pain for, for four or five years, uh, she had a cortisone injection every three months, but then the pain really doesn't last long when I saw her. She didn't have a lot of leg pain, but mo mostly in her XL lower back pain. She takes a bit of Plexia, IR and Voltaren, PRN for her pain. But uh, when you look at her, her imaging, there's a, quite a few levels, like three or four levels of degenerative changes. She has seen a neurosurgeon, but neurosurgeon think that if she doesn't have any radical leg pain, there's no claudication pain. This patient didn't need any surgery. And you can see in her MRI, there's multi-level uh, uh, degeneration, especially L3-4 and L4-5. Uh, you can see on the axial cut too, the facet joint, especially uh, on the right-hand side, is quite arthritic and a reduced joint space. And the bones can also show on both sides, there's black spots on, on the L4-5 facet joint. On the CD scan, uh, especially on the axial cut, it shows joint space narrowing. So this patient is clear cut, very easy. We book her for both levels. Uh, bilateral uh, L3, 4, and L4, 5 facet joint meter branch uh, radio frequency in one setting. Uh, we put a patient prone under a little, very minimal sedation. Uh, we, we tilt the C arm a little bit on the right, place three needles on L2, L3, L4 meter branch, and start the radio frequency. And, and then while doing radio frequency on the right side, we tilt the C arm to the left, and we do the, another three levels confirm with an AP to make sure all the needles in good position and also confirm with a 
lateral x-ray, which is very important to, to make sure that our needles are not advanced to anterior to cause problem in the nerve root. And, and we are satisfied. And this procedure only takes about uh, 20 minutes to, uh, and, and the patient uh, is a day surgery and within uh, 48 hours, the, the discomfort from the injection is usually subside. So, and sometimes we see some patients who are much younger, who might also uh, have widespread osteoarthritis. So I have this quite unfortunate patient who's below 60 years old, he's short, he's overweight, he's got generalized uh, osteoarthritis in his cervical spine, both shoulders, both knees, both hips, and extensive uh, lumbar spine degenerative changes. And you can see in his uh, AP x-ray, there's a bit of scoliosis and then L4, 5, L5, L5, S1 is all collapsed, especially on the lateral x-ray, the L5, S1 is really, uh, the disc is quite narrow. He also, apart from having back pain, he also have bilateral leg pain all the way down to his ankle. So we think it's probably the L5 and nerve root compression. It takes quite a fair bit of opioid medication due to his widespread osteoarthritic pain. So we, we booked this patient in for some radiofrequency ablation. You can see on the lateral x-ray, his L5-S1 disc is all collapsed. So we, we, we wanted to, to perform the worst two level, which is L5-S1 and L4-5. You can see three needles on the right, three needles on the left. L, L5 dorsal remise is a bit tricky. So we have to do a few x-ray views to make sure the tip of our needle is at the groove where the L5 dorsal remise uh, comes out. So with, with that view, we're happy that we, we, we are targeting the L5 dorsal remise. And again, we have to do a lateral x-ray to make sure that our, our needle is in a good position, not to anterior to cause any nerve root injury. And at the same time, when we're still performing the radio frequency, you can see that we're putting a needle on the right side of the L5 S1 to, to do a, a transformer epidural block to help with his leg pain. So this procedure only takes uh, about half an hour, minimal sedation, and the patient goes home on the same day, good recovery. And when we see the patient in four to six weeks time, the patient gets better. We, we encourage the patient to, to to, to increase his exercise regime, to, to strengthen his lumbar spine and lower limb. And the second more, most common condition I see, apart from uh, after lower back pain is neck pain. And neck pain, again, a, a, a lot of my patients are elderly, usually above 60s, 70s and 80s. And when you're above 60 and 70, most of the neck pain, half of the neck pain can be associated with a facet joint pain. Uh, facet joint arthropathy in the cervical spine is usually due to aging, or sometimes in a younger patient, they could have as uh, MVA in the past, or they're a rugby league player. They had a lot of acceleration, deceleration injury when they were younger. And then five or 10 years later, uh, they develop a facet joint arthropathy. Uh, one good thing about cervical facet joint a pain, they, they correlates with the level of this, where the cervical spine is affected. So your patient presented to me with an upper cervical neck pain with occipital uh, headache uh, due to the facet joint problem, usually the C12 and C23. A C12, uh, we associate with reduced uh, uh, rotation to the left and right. If a patient is over 75 and has poor rotation to the right and left, and usually the problem is at C1, C2. The patient of mid cervical neck pain is usually C34 and C45. Or if a patient has a more of a lower cervical neck pain, is usually C5, 6, or C6, C7, which the pain can re refer down to the scapular area. So again, a CD scan is very good to, to diagnose a cervical facet arthropathy, uh, whether it's a corona section or, or sagittal section, you can see that there is reduced joint space and also osteophytes formation. If the patient has multi-level uh, facet joint problem, you can do a bone scan and spec CT to see which level exert the most activity. And in this patient, you can see on the right side at the C34 level. Uh, so recently I, I, I have a patient who has multi-level, we, we see a lot of patients with multi-level degenerative cervical or lumbar uh, arthropathy, and usually they are above 70 or 80 or 90 years. So I just wanna share with you a case where uh, this patient had only neck pain 
on the right side, there's no radicular arm pain. Uh, patient is on some Lyrica and some Panadine for, uh, three to four a day for her pain. When she presented with this MRI for right-sided neck pain, if you look at a sagittal MRI, it didn't look that bad. All the discs, there's no protrusion. There's only minimal disc bulge. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you do some other view on the MRI, whether it's uh, the, the radiologist has provided me with some sagittal or oblique sagittal view, the left uh, side looks pretty good where all the nerve root comes up without any compression. But if you look on the oblique sagittal right side, you can see at the posterior segment, there's, a, a, you know, in the lower part, C4, C5, C6 level, there's degeneration. On the axial cut, you can see on the right side, uh, compared to the left side, the, the, the facet joint is it's, uh, more arthritic and there's also uh, osteophytes. And then when I look at the CT scan on the axial cut, uh, the top one is C3, 4, the middle one, C4, 5, and C5, C6, the bottom one, you can see the facet joint is all arthritic and, and narrowed. And especially on the middle one at C4, 5, there's, there's hardly any facet joint space seen. It's all ankylos and also sclerosis. And so we think this patient suffers from three, three levels facet joint arthropathy. And the target facet joint arthropathy is like the lumbar. It's just, you know, we, we do a diagnostic block on, on, on the middle branch. And if they have successful block, we book them in for radiofrequency ablation or three or four levels or one setting. And good, one good thing about middle branch nerves in, in the cervical spine, they, they are quite consistent. They, they usually lies in the middle of the articular process. So, so what we do is we book the patient in and under, under a bit of sedation on a prone position, uh, you can see on this X-ray, uh, there's osteophytes on the left side, but more on the right side at C3, 4, C4, 5, C5, 6. And we place the needle at the groove uh, where the articular pillar is. And we always confirm with two or three views. This is a lateral view that the bottom needle you can't see very well because it's obliterated by the shoulder. So you can do, we can also do an oblique, contralateral oblique view to make sure that our needle is at a good position. And again, this procedure only takes about 20, 30 minutes and the patient is, uh, will go home on the same day and within 24 hours, their, you know, their discomforts get better. I would like to share with you other pain condition that we see quite a lot in a pain clinic, uh, which is not very common in a general uh, public, but we see them a lot because we get referred a lot by orthopedic hand surgeon or foot surgeon. Uh, this condition you can see on this diagram is the right hand is swollen, it's red, it's very painful uh, after a small surgery or, or, or very minor injury, or sometimes uh, due to a collis fracture in the wrist. This is what we call acute uh, complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS. We see a lot in our pain clinic. And sometimes if a patient has pain for more than six months or 12 months, they, they get very physically deconditioned, a lot of fear avoidance, and they don't want to move their hands. And they're in pain all the time. They become very, very depressed and anxious. So this is how a patient usually needs multidisciplinary management with a physiotherapy, psychologist, and, and a lot of anti-neuropathic medication. And if the patient has a lot of pain symptoms, we can also offer them a sympathetic ganglion block, especially on the stellar ganglion, which is a, a big inferior and a thoracic, uh, upper thoracic uh, sympathetic ganglion. So these procedures are, are quite easy to perform. We do a diagnostic block at the C7 level. Uh, the the, the stellar ganglion is usually lies on, on top of the longest colon muscles. And uh, we place a needle at C7, put some contrast and the nerve block is positive. The next time we can and, and provide a patient with radio frequency ablation or pulse radio frequency on that stellar ganglion to provide a prolonged pain relief. And CRPS is so commonly affects the, the lower limb. And especially if, if, if uh, some patient has very minor injury, rolling their ankle, uh, one day playing basketball or base uh, or, or or netball, and then, then two weeks later, the whole leg is swollen and red and painful. And this is what we call so, so say is uh, regional, complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS. Again, we would need to refer to physiotherapy and psychologists because this, this condition progressed really very fast. And if we can catch this condition 
and treated within the first six months to 12 months, their success rate is very high. And we also can provide some sympathetic uh, nerve block to reduce the pain intensity. And one of them is lumbar sympathetic nerve block uh, at L2 or L3 or L4 level. And uh, puts, uh, this is what we do. Uh, we do a diagnostic block. And if the block is positive, the next time we can book that patient for radiofrequency ablation of the sympathetic uh, chain. And this can give patient a, a good, at least three to six months of uh, reduced pain intensity so that the patient can work with a physiotherapy to, to increase the physical function. And, and another subset of patient we see a lot is patient who suffers from ongoing back pain despite multiple surgery. So my, my last five minutes will, will focus on, on post in, in the past, we call this condition a fail back surgery, surgery syndrome, but I think it's, it's better to use the term persistent post lumbar surgery pain. Uh, this patient, Janet, who has had three lumbar surgeries in the past, like laminectomy L45, followed by fusion and then extension of fusion, but her pain has been persistent. So when we did the x ray and, and scan, we see that she has ongoing adjacent level degeneration at L3, 4, and even L2, 3. We provide her with some nerve block at, at adjacent level L3, 4, but she still has ongoing pain. So one other intervention that we can provide a patient is called a spinal cord stimulation trial. Uh, we insert two electrodes up into the lower thoracic region, usually around T8 to T10, try it for seven days. These electrodes are connected to, to external battery, uh, at the end of the trial, we pulled the electrodes out. This patient was very successful. She had 80% of pain reduction. Apart from the pain uh, relief, she also had improved function, uh, increased activity. She was walking more. She had better sleep and she stopped her charging and end on. And that's a very, really positive trial for this patient. And four weeks later, we booked her in to, 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 to insert a permanent implant of the spinal cord stimulator. Both the electrodes inserted up to T8 in a posterior epidural space connected to, to a battery and a, a battery sits under the skin in the gluteal region. And also we have seen a few injured worker. We know the injured worker can, uh, who is undergoing active work cover uh, compensation can be very complex, but we, you know, we sometimes see some patient who wants to be better, who wants to get out of the compensation or insurance claim. And one of them is one of the patient that was seen a few years, uh, two years ago. She's been complaining of pain even when she was 16, when she was working in KFC, she fell uh, on the floor, uh, had a disc protrusion. So at the age of 17, she had discectomy at L5-S1. Two years later, she had a fusion at L5-S1. I mean, I can't imagine a, a patient at the young age below 20 that had fusion. Then it didn't work. The, the, the hardware was removed. She was complaining of pain for 20 odd years. And then she had a fourth surgery five years ago for a laminectomy L4-5. She's still having a lot of pain. And a pain diagram shows that she has left-sided back pain and left leg pain. And you have look at an MRI, there's not a lot of problem. Uh, there's no adjacent level problem. There's no disc protrusion. There's only a bit of a reduced disc type L5-S1. The hardware is on L5-S1 has been taken out. So we trial her in November, 2019 with spinal cord stimulation. Uh, she was only having about 50% of improvement uh, because she was successful. We inserted the implant and the first few months, we were, she was uh, saying that 50% of improvement, but we pursue on with physical therapy, continue her with psych seeing a psychologist improve her mental health and, and physical uh, function. And in the last 12 months, she said she had an 80% of pain re uh, reduction. She's back in the gym, running, cycling, boxing, something that she hasn't done for 20 years. And now she's working full-time as an IT manager and she stopped taking her Tarjan, Endon and Panadin Ford. So again, it, you know, this really worked, even though she's a workers' compensation patient, but she did very well. Uh, there are some conditions that we know that any intervention or monotherapy or spinal cord stimulation unlikely to work. One of the five is widespread body pain with fibromyalgia or central sensitization. When a patient presents you with this kind of pain diagram, we know that we need to have the full gamut of our pain management. Extensive muscular pain like polymyalgia, rheumatica, or glutotendinopathy, it doesn't work. Again, work how a patient with secondary gain, a severe psychology disorder, PTSD, severe anxiety, bipolar, uh, you know, uh, 
spinal cord stimulation doesn't work. In a patient taking high opioids, uh, like morphine equivalent, more than 100 milligram a day, it doesn't work. So in this type of patient, we probably need the whole gamut of the five pillars of multidisciplinary, multimodal management for this patient. I think my time is probably up. I will probably not go on and maybe it's a time to open up to, for questions. So if anyone wants to, to contact us more about pain management, this is my details. This is my private email and uh, our website and a clinic telephone number. Thank you. Nice talk. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yu. So Dr. Ron Greno, Greno is a neurologist and will be speaking on demystifying migraine. Thank you. Hi, good evening, and I hope everyone's managing okay with the lockdowns. Um, I thought I'd talk today about chronic migraine, um, mainly because there are new medications out and that, that's gotten, uh, I presume, more, more patients out to you uh, asking about these sorts of things. So I thought I'd, I'd give you a sort of a background about migraine, chronic migraine, and then talk more about specifically what these new medications are and where they fit into the overall scheme of managing migraine. To start with, um, I wanted to make a, a clear point that migraine isn't just a headache. Um, migraine's just not head pain alone. It it's comes as part of a whole constellation of neurological problems with their own mechanisms. Um, to, to start with, we've got lots of different triggers on the background of a genetic predisposition. Up to 50% of patients uh, have a, a family history of migraine and autosomal dominant sort of pattern. And they're sensitized to certain triggers, which I'll talk about later in, in, in trigger management. But those things seem to then uh, start a process that will sort of climax in a headache in, in, in that sense, but, but it involves a lot more. So to start with, there's this premonitory phase. And that's what a lot of people uh, get confused about when they talk about um, what a migraine is uh, as a trigger and what a migraine actually is. So often the food cravings, the patients will associate, I eat chocolate, I get a migraine, is often just the beginning, the, the premonitory phase, the prodrome of a migraine where patients will start to crave certain things like chocolate and, and uh, citrus and all those things that we used to think were the beginning, uh, were the triggers of a migraine, but in fact are just the beginning of a migraine and manifestations. Some patients feel very tired, some patients feel elated and ecstatic. And a lot of the time they won't recognize these sorts of symptoms so much, but often their partners will. And these are the things that I go through with my patients to see if we can start to identify the times when they're going to be more likely to have a migraine because the key to acute therapy is, uh, is treating early. So, so they need to understand when, when that's about to happen. Next is aura. It's actually quite uncommon. In, in most studies, it's seen as around 15%. So not having an aura doesn't mean it's not a migraine in any way, shape, or form. The typical changes of visual changes, they, the, the key parts of a migraine aura, as opposed to, uh, say, stroke or amaurosis fugax, is it's, it's progressive. So it's small. It starts in an area. It spreads and gets bigger, but also it's got positive features, not just negative features. In other words, it's not just a loss of vision or a loss of speech or a loss of feeling. It also has positive features. So it's often uh, shown as having different colors, bright, sparkly, shiny visual changes, as well as a lot of paresthesia and other, other positive sensory features, not just the negative sensory features um, that you'd expect with a stroke. Then comes the headache, and I'll go through diagnostic criteria in a second. Um, often with its associations, nausea, vomiting, uh, sensory disturbances, particularly um, sensitivity to external stimuli. So it's not just lights and sounds, it's also smells. And often the vertigo component or the, the motion sensitivity component, which is something that was only really recognized as vestibular migraine in the last four or five years, um, also comes out quite often. But the other thing that's important to mention here is it's not just a physical pain thing, it's also a neurological disability. So people have poor concentration, they have brain fog, what they describe as brain fog. They just can't think straight or function properly 
completely independent of any sedating effects of any medications or anything else. So it, it's very much a whole of, of brain sort of experience rather than a headache as such. And I've got a number of patients who, even when they don't have much in the way of headache, and some patients have very little headache, are still quite disabled by all these other sort of non-pain features. And they still do respond to, to therapy, particularly to prophylaxis, which makes them less intense and less frequent, which I'll go through later. And then after that, even when that phase is over, a lot of these sorts of symptoms do persist. And patients describe this sort of a hangover feeling where they're tired and don't, don't really feel like eating and are still often wiped out. And, and, and some patients will still be unable to function even in this sort of post-drome phase, even once the pain has actually resolved. Alrighty, so in terms of, the, these are the formal criteria for migraine. I think that they're a good starting point, but there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of flexibility when, when you try and apply these to, to real patients. So the, the, the numbers are at least five headache attacks that last four to 72 hours that, that uh, are either untreated or unsuccessfully treated. So the duration is important. And then two of the other uh, features, unilateral location, a pulsating or throbbing quality, it's got to be moderate or severe pain, and then of functional consequence. In other words, causing avoidance of, of physical activity such as walking. And then one of the other associations, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and phonophobia. Now, often you'll find patients who do have migraine that don't quite fit into these. These are criteria that are more often than not used for uh, clinical trials in migraine. So patients who are enrolled in all the trials for the therapeutics. But you do get the, the feel that it tends to be more unilateral. It tends to be more pulsatile. If they're mild pain, you, you, you'll be less likely to call it migraine, but often they'll have other features like the nausea, the photophobia, the osmophobia, and then the disability really of the brain fog. And, and I can't really do anything. I can't function. That starts to hint that these are patients who do have a migraine. And then often vestibular features and other things also throw into that. And I get my patients to fill in uh, quite a complicated intake questionnaire that, that goes through a lot of these sorts of features and what features trouble them the most as well. And then for, for the, the specific purpose of, of diagnosing chronic migraine and treating it with the two major new therapies we have, which are uh, Botox and the new CGRP receptor blockers, we need to have a, a definition of chronic migraine because those medications are only applicable to patients with chronic migraine. Um, and that basically is headaches that, are, that satisfy the definition for migraine occur of 15 days a month and at least eight migraine days a month. Um, and then to have the PBS criteria to treat with those other medications, you also need to have failed three other preventatives. So it's important to, to realize those because when patients come and say, can I have Botox? And they have only four headache days a month. The answer is no, not on the PBS. And it's probably not appropriate, but the other, the other medications may be more appropriate depending on how things go. The key point to make here though, is a lot of patients come to me and say, I've got four or five headaches a month. And I say, okay, good. How long does each one last? two days. So now we're up to 10 headache days a month. Um, and for the rest of the time, you're headache free, no pain whatsoever. And they go, well, I just thought that was, you know, not much, but I usually have some sort of pain over my head somewhere, you know, for another 10 days, but I, I don't really take too much notice of it. And these are the sorts of people who really are underestimating their, their, their migraine frequency. And you may think to yourself, well, that, that's quite rare. And the answer is not at all. As a rule of thumb, I, I ask patients what their migraine frequency is. And then generally, once we get them to use a headache diary, um, which I give every patient, you'll usually find that it's at least double what they say. Once you ask them for, for other types of headaches and, and other milder headaches, which are just sort of a form fruist of migraine, a headache that would have been a migraine, but didn't, didn't sort of eventuate to a full blown attack. How often is it? It's a lot more often than, than we uh, care to imagine. Uh, the, the statistics are that one in five patients will have a migraine at some point in their lives. So that's a huge number. Um, and then the, the, the numbers 
getting towards 15 headache days a month and, and uh, chronic migraine type of definitions for a, a, a research study are somewhere between one and 5%. So it's a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people who often I find uh, have, have sought medical help or, and not quite been recognized or have, uh, have tried one thing and then stopped. And, and I think the key, uh, the key point is whenever new therapies come out, a lot of patients start back into the medical system to say, well, is there something that can help me? And I think the answer is there's a lot of things we can do to help as long as we recognize that there are a, a vast array of different things we can do. And then we've got to go through things sequentially to offer that help. Just a quick run through um, why migraine is more than just uh, more than just a headache. It, it's a neurological condition. So whatever trigger uh, occurs leads to activation in the brain stem, generally in the dorsal raphae nuclei, then through an output through the, the pterygopalatine ganglion, we actually have neurogenic inflammation um, of the dura and the dural blood vessels. Um, the, the chemical that's involved, the neurotransmitter that's involved in that final step is CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide. That's one to keep in mind because that's obviously the target of the new medications that we have. So that's, that's where that comes in. Thereafter, we get uh, pain messages to the brain and involvement of the thalamus, which is the, the receptor site of the pain signals as well. So that's why it's a tri trigeminothalamic type of a problem. But the connections of these, these areas is quite widespread into the cortex and the hypothalamus. So they do have quite a wide range of, of neurological um, connections that are involved to tell us that this is more than just a, a single point of pain. Just a quick question that I often get asked is, when do we worry? And the answer is, when you have a good solid clinical diagnosis of a migraine, um, the chances are less than 0.045% uh, of there being a significant underlying problem. Uh, and therefore, we, we tend to recommend when there's a good clinical diagnosis of migraine that, that investigation is not warranted and, and a lot of the guidelines uh, advocate against um, doing unnecessary investigations because if nothing else, um, there's a, a reasonable chance of incidental abnormalities and, and greater stress on the patient. However, if there are definite physical signs or fixed abnormal neurological signs, um, then definitely we'll image. So raised intracranial pressure, fixed neurological deficits, seizures, most definitely. Um, anything that alters consciousness, memory, or, or coordination. Um, and, and obviously, if there's a, the, a history of, of uh, cancer, else, cancer elsewhere in the body. And I have to say, magnetic resonance imaging is the modality of choice. CT really doesn't pick up a lot of these things, uh, and if it does, not very frequently. The other point I'd also say is often when patients have a fixed headache that keeps coming and going, but always the same side, the same uh, character, everything is identical, then that certainly is a, an indication, even if it's longer history um, to image. And as an example, I saw uh, a 28-year-old girl who came in with right-sided migraine with a history of well over 10 years um, and always had, uh, always had the aura on the right side, always the same aura every time, and then a left-sided headache. And I imaged her and she actually had quite an extensively large uh, left occipital arteriovenous malformation, which needed therapy. So it, it's always good to just see when things are, uh, are typical, um, too typical, too stereotyped, then that's also an issue. So you'd like to see that the migraines switch sides and things like that as well. So then I thought I'd go through uh, different types of therapy. I think one of the key things is, is to offer acute therapy to everybody because the most disabling part is the acute migraine attack. And th there are certainly a lot of things we can do um, to, to at least manage that in the process of referring and saying, well, you, you'll need prophylaxis and, and other bits and pieces. But, you know, we can certainly uh, start to, uh, to make headway on it. So the, the key points, as I was alluding to earlier, are early treatment. And what you're trying to do there is abort a migraine. So early therapy ma makes the duration of each episode much shorter, makes the severity less as well. 
as opposed to late or no therapy where things just last longer and more severe and patients are more disabled. And that's what we're trying to do is get in there and at least get rid of some of the disability. A lot of the, the fear that a lot of migraine patients have is of the next migraine attack. Where will I be? I shouldn't go out because it'll be disabling and terrible and I just need to get home. And so they're often more afraid and more disabled by their fear of the migraine than sometimes the migraine attacks actually are. So it's very important to give them the reassurance that at least we've got you covered and you should start to get out and do some of the things that, that you want to do if you're not in lockdown anyway. Now, what I often find is combination therapy, particularly when, when acute therapy is more difficult to do, then you, you select the appropriate triptan for the patients. Uh, Max Salt and Relpax I find most effective, but you often will, will use a, uh, you'll trial different ones until you get the right one for the patient, often in combination with non-steroidal and then anti-nausea medications, um, particularly important um, for patients who, who uh, can't tolerate their old medications. Um, some of the triptans can be given via nasal spray and as a uh, wafer as well. So there are also things to consider, particularly in patients with early vomiting. But the, the most important uh, part that we then play is migraine prophylaxis. Now, prophylaxis is indicated for patients who have more than four headache, headaches a month. And I, I often use that really as four headache days a month. Um, if I have given them a good try of acute therapy, and despite that, the headache still goes on the next day, um, and they average more than four days a month, then that too requires prophylaxis. In chronic migraine, of course, then we're talking about patients with 15 headache days a month, and it needs to be recorded in a headache diary, which I have on my website, and I'm happy to share um, with anyone who wants one. The, the key thing that I, that I find very important with patients, and I have uh, a handout I give patients where each one of these and several other factors are actually dealt with specifically um, with an online course I created for each of these is the, the triggers and the, the lifestyle modifications that are, are very useful in managing and controlling chronic migraine. So stress is, is a well-known association with chronic migraine, and it's always difficult to know what's chicken, what's egg, and the answer is it's probably a bit of both. The more stress you are, the, you're, you're under, the more uh, migraine episodes you'll have, the more migraine episodes you have, the more fear and stress you have, and therefore you'll get more, more headaches. And it does tend to be a self-perpetuating cycle. And that's why we have to sort of address all these factors um, and often in multidisciplinary way as well. And using a psychologist uh, is often very useful in this sense as well. Dry eyes have an association with migraine. Um, food is a tricky one. I'm often asked, what's the best diet for migraine? And the answer is a good quality diet in general. The food restriction that we used to think of, and there was one study that talked about that as being very effective, was never reproduced. And at the moment, the best things we have are a high quality diet. And I get my patients to fill out a questionnaire to assess their diet quality and can involve a dietitian as required if counseling is enough. Um, to, to try and optimize these things, to try and reduce all the underlying elements. And I've got lots of patients who say, look, I've been under more stress. I know I'm eating poorly and my migraines are out of control. So it's a very, very common sort of cycle that we need to interrupt on every level. Alcohol is a, is a common and reliable trigger for a, a percentage of patients. And if they know that they drink either a certain alcoholic beverage or any alcohol and they will get a headache, uh, straight after that, the answer is avoid it. Um, some patients will have a threshold, other patients will simply say, I have anything, I have a headache. And sleep, in general, the answer is if you don't sleep enough or you don't have a good quality of sleep, then, then that can be a trigger. And therefore, I also talk to patients about sleep hygiene, about maintaining sleep quality and also screen for hypersomnolence and sleep apnea as well. And Last, as I mentioned before, pain psychology can be a benefit and they go through and address a lot of those different factors, the stress and the fear as well. And lastly, I'll throw in acupuncture. Acupuncture has a, a controversial part uh, in, in migraine in general. There are some studies showing that it is effective. The, the, risk of, the risk of the procedure is fairly low. So if patients want to try it, then I certainly let them. And occasionally uh, I do hear of patients who, who've had benefit. Next comes the cycle of what we do 
to try and find uh, an effective therapy for patients. So the, the, the basic upshot of all of this is, is you have to find the right medication for the individual. And you know, while, whilst personalized medicine is a, a more of a catch cry these days, it's, it's been the case for a long time where we have to find the right medication for the right patient. So often that will either be uh, individualized to their comorbidities. So for example, if they have insomnia or depression or a component of anxiety, then particularly the sedating tricyclic antidepressants may be useful. Um, if they have other anxiety um, and don't have asthma, then a beta blocker can be useful. So we, we try and tailor the, the right medication for the patient's circumstances. At this stage, there's no unfortunately perfect way of telling which drug will work ahead of time in which patient. Um, and I'm doing some research to try and see if we can get AI to help us figure that out. But at this stage, it's a matter of trial and error. And so you have to have the right length of trial, minimum of four to six weeks, often eight weeks. If they have daily headaches, then you can usually get a, a reasonable idea if there's going to be efficacy uh, in the first four or so weeks, but otherwise it can take longer. And it's important to, as I mentioned before, make sure that patients have a diary. That's the way to objectively know that things are different, better or, or not. And then once we do find, so we'll cycle through uh, different medications until we find the right one that's tolerable and that's effective, then patients stay on medications for at least six months and I continue to assess their response with a diary. And as long as things are held well, after six months, we can try to win the medication either to the minimum effective dose or slowly reduce and wait for uh, hopefully no new uh, upsurge in, in migraine frequency to occur. And occasionally we can also wean patients entirely um, it tends to happen a lot more easily with patients without chronic migraine, more in the episodic, high episodic range. But I've certainly had lots of patients um, with chronic migraine with both Botox and the new medications who I've, I've reduced to a couple of headaches a month. And you lengthen the cycles between medication doses and nothing changes. And certainly I've had similar experiences with, with oral medications as well. So any or all of these can be effective and particularly effective and can even be withdrawn and no, no loss of control. So to give you a, a, a range of choices, there are a lot. The beta blockers are there, propranolol in particular, which is centrally acting, angiotensin II receptor inhibitors, candesartan in particular there. The tricyclics, pretty much all of them uh, I've used and, and not infrequently you will use one and then another um, if, if uh, nothing else is working. And I've certainly had patients in whom one tricyclic didn't work and another one did. So it's certainly worth looking at a few different drugs in that particular class. The SNRI, particularly venlafaxine, has been useful. Anticonvulsants, there are a whole bunch. Uh, Topiramate is the one with the most evidence of efficacy. The trials were several hundred patients, um, but there are lots of others, including Epilim, to a lesser extent, Tegretol and Lamictal, I tend to not find very effective. Then the sort of sedating antihistamine type medications, periactin, which is cyproheptadine and sandomigran, are both effective um, and uh, good for patients who, who uh, have issues with insomnia, but um, weight gain is a, a, a small factor to consider at times. There are a bunch of vitamins and supplements, dietary supplements that are also effective um, and often patients will, will uh, try those concomitantly because a lot of patients want to try something like that. And uh, uh, I certainly have handouts for, for patients to describe those. And then finally, we've got botulinum toxin and the new CGRP receptor blockers. So how to choose, as I said, we need to tailor it to the patient and then a sequential trial. If after the four, six, eight weeks, there's been no change, we move on to the next one, try and tailor that as best we can to the patient, try that again and move on. If we failed three oral medications in patients with chronic migraine, then we can move on to the CGRP receptor blockers. So just to give you again, a rough idea of how these things work, these are antibodies either against the CGRP molecule itself or against the, the receptors themselves to block the action of CGRP. And I'll show you which, which is which. But interestingly enough, um, what 
has been found more recently since the research into CGRPs really took hold is that Botox itself, botulinum toxin, is uptaken into the, the nerves uh, where it's injected and retrogradely transported to the brain where it blocks the release of CGRP by blocking the, the vesicle being excreted. So it too is a CGRP receptor blocker, but the mechanism of action is completely different. And I have to say, um, I've used it extensively in combination with the CGRP blockers themselves, but you have to, firstly, that's not, not uh, on the PBS. Um, and secondly, you give everything else a go first, but the combination certainly is quite effective in, in my experience. So then we've got behind each door, different ones, um, and only the last door, door number three, which is Mgality at the moment is PBS listed, but I suspect a Jovi will be relatively soon. Unfortunately, Amavig, um, which is a completely different mechanism of action will not be. So in terms of effectiveness, they're all very effective. Um, two ways really of, of measuring. Uh, what you're really after is a percentage of people reporting a 50% or more reduction in migraine days. Why is that? Because they're the, the, the patients who will be allowed to continue therapy on the PBS. Botox is the same. So you're after, you're after patients showing significant benefit and those who have some improvement will not uh, continue on the therapy. And I have to say cost or no cost, Medicare or no, if, if really it doesn't show a great deal of difference, um, then there's not much point um, in continuing the therapy. So you're selecting out roughly 40% or so of patients who have a significant response. And you can see that the, the headache day reduction is, is much smaller um, than the 50% response um, that you see in these categories. Um, it's hard to compare between trials, um, but the 28% reduction, 28% uh, proportion uh, in Amgality is the lower one, but that's the medication currently on the PBS. Um, just to give you a, a, a quick overview, Amgality has its own, has its own uh, auto injector, whereas a, a Jovi comes in a pre-filled syringe. Um, a Jovi can be given three injections every three months or one a month, um, whereas Amgality is given twice uh, at the start and then one injection per month. These are typically injection site reactions and I have to say hypersensitivity I've seen very, very rarely. Um, these bind to the peptide itself, whereas Amavig binds to the receptor. Um, but Amavig unlikely to ever be listed on the PBS, though it's a leading uh, substance worldwide. Um, just to finish off, because I, I can see we, we're uh, running out of time, Botox therapy still remains, in my opinion, probably more effective um, and, and certainly highly effective therapy uh, and should not be forgotten. Um, and certainly in the order of 40 to 50% uh, of responders, in other words, patients have a more than 50% reduction in baseline uh, headache days. And I have to say in a lot of my patients, I inject beyond the, the standard uh, locations, which are at the front temples, occipital regions, upper cervical and trapezius, and uh, also add uh, further injections up to 10 in uh, areas where patients have specific pain, and I find that that probably increases, increases that responder rate in, into the order of 60 or 70%. So it's a very, very effective medication that shouldn't be forgotten. And so just to summarize, and then happy to take questions, um, we've got to make sure we have the, the uh, right diagnosis for the patients, make sure they have a migraine and exclude other things. Make sure that we have acute therapy right and, and uh, the other point that I'll make quickly is that acute therapy actually works better once you have a proper preventative. It makes all acute therapy look better. So the numbers are better, but the response to whatever triptan or NSAID you use is much improved when, when there's a, an effective preventative. And not to forget trigger management and psychological uh, therapy there as well um, is, is key to, to making sure that we manage things appropriately uh, in a more holistic way, because often, you can't just get success from medications alone, and you shouldn't. You should try and sort of deal with underlying predispositions and risk factors. So I'll leave things there and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Granot. Uh, the first question is, is waking first thing with a migraine in process? 
sorry, a migraine in progress, e.g. visual aura, a red flag symptom? Uh, generally, no. I mean, I have to say a lot of patients wake up uh, with, with a typical migraine, uh, often from bed. Um, so no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see that as a red flag. And, and interesting enough, once you go back and ask them, um, did you have any prodrome symptoms the night before, were you particularly tired or particularly elated, they'll often then be able to start to pick uh, the nights when they will wake with, with uh, a migraine. Um, but I have to say, if they're not typical migraines, the history is a bit short and they're purely nocturnal onset headaches alone, that, that then may, may be a reasonable thing to, to scan them, at least once just to make sure, given how easy scans are and how available they are. But, but in general, nocturnal onset migraine, that's typical as part of a migraine complex, isn't a red flag as such, but certainly can be used. Uh, they're harder ones to treat. So often people should use NSAIDs or a triptan before going to bed if they're fairly confident that it's going to come on. And I've had lots of patients use long acting triptans and not wake up the next day and, and we can get rid of nocturnal onset headaches that way. Okay, the next question is, is the role with prophylactic treatments for patients solely with vestibular symptoms rather than the typical headache? So is there, is there a role? Oh, is there a role? Well, no, no. So, so certainly vestibular migraine, um, vestibular migraine certainly uh, needs prophylaxis, but there is data to show that the triptans can also help, help the vestibular component, um, which I've found in some patients, but, but by no means is it, is it the vast majority of patients with significant vestibular migraine. And yes, the answer is then you, you focus more on the prevention. Okay, the next question is, which beta blocker is recommended? So I have to say, in my experience, I tend to use propranolol, uh, aiming for a dose of uh, gradually building up to a dose of 120 milligrams. Metoprolol is in the literature, but I have to say, I've, I've had lots of patients who have not, not really responded, so I tend not to use it. Any particular recommendations for prophylactic agent in young, thin females with low resting BP and apprehensive about weight gain? So, so uh, those who, who don't want weight gain, the, the two anticonvulsants uh, that are often helpful are topiramate and uh, uh, zanisamide, zonagrin. Zonagrin is not on the PBS, but topiramate is. Um, and topiramate is associated with weight loss, not weight gain. So often those patients who are paranoid about weight gain um, will, will then be happy to try that. Um, the other point to make is a lot of those other agents, even, even periactin and sandomigran, um, have weight gain as a side effect, but by no means is it universal. And I've, I've had lots of patients in whom there was no weight gain. And occasionally, uh, most of the time it's through appetite increase. So if they don't notice an appetite increase, they won't notice weight gain. But I agree that the antidepressants can certainly cause that without uh, appetite change. Thank you very much, Dr. Granite. That was very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Thanks. Martina Gleason will be speaking on health pathways. Thank you. Just great. Thank you very much, Susan. I'll be very brief because I know everyone will be keen to get on with getting ready for bed. Um, I'm just here to let you know about the health pathways that are available um, for uh, you related to tonight's presentations. Um, I'm actually presenting the pathways that are available in the southeastern Sydney, which is uh, the area the Prince of Wales is in, but also Sydney because their team's been going longer and they have some more pathways than us. And we now have the facility for you to be able to use the same login details for both health pathways platforms. So um, I've got the QR codes here for you so you can use your phone to to log in um, to either of the teams um, and then you can save the login details uh, if you haven't done that already. And I've also got the uh, web addresses for them if you want to type them into your desktop in the future. Um, so the login details for Southeastern Sydney are the username is SE Sydney and the password is healthcare. Uh, and for Sydney, uh, the username is connected and the password is healthcare. But after an agreement between the two teams, 
because we're in the same PHN, you can use either sets of logins for either of the Health Pathways platforms. So that makes it easier for you. Um, I'm hoping people find that helpful. Uh, the benefit of using Southeastern Sydney is that it does help you identify the local referral pathways, whereas the Sydney um, pathways will have the Sydney local health district pathways. So if you're working from Alexandria and sometimes you send people into Sydney local health district like RPA, it's good to have access to those referral pathways. Uh, but if you're living in the living and working uh, really well and truly in the southeastern Sydney then you'll want to be checking out our pathways for your referral pathways. Um, just a list of the pathways that southeastern Sydney has currently available um, for use re relating to tonight's um, presentations. We've got pathways on chronic pain, medications in chronic pain, chronic pain specialised assessment. So that's how you can identify uh, the specialists in chronic pain in both the public system and the private system and how to refer into those um, into those clinics because sometimes that can be a bit mysterious. Chronic pain specialised advice is the page that you go to if you want to find the name of someone to ring and ask for some advice. And then we've got pain management in palliative care, which obviously isn't about the sort of things that people are talking about tonight, but is still quite relevant. And quite a few others more in development. I'm really hoping that Jason will agree to work with us on a pelvic, chronic pelvic pain pathway. Sydney Health Pathways has um, chronic pelvic pain, which is currently under review. Um, what that means is that their current pathway has been up for about three years and they're reviewing it to see if there is more updated information available. Chronic non-cancer pain, interventions in chronic pain, uh, chronic use and de-prescribing of codeine, neuropathic pain, pain management and assessment, um, acute back pain, fibromyalgia, and quite a few more. If you're not quite sure, um, if you go on the left-hand side of the Health Pathway um, front page, uh, the index, uh, if you look under general medicine, uh, pain has its own listing, and then you'll be able to identify all of the pathways that are available in that listing. And so once more, just for your uh, benefit, um, if you would like to get in contact with us to suggest that we develop new pathways or to give us feedback on pathways that we have, uh, these are the contact details of the teams from both Southeastern Sydney and Sydney. And uh, please take note of uh, this little icon here, the little blue button with the text box because every pathway has one of those little icons and if you want to send us feedback on the pathway click on that icon and send it and uh, those of you who have sent us feedback in the past will know that we really do endeavour to um, address your feedback uh, especially if we're asked to change something and it seems appropriate. Um, we just recently changed some of the details on our scheduling a patient after feedback from one of the nurses who works in the local health district. So we try to be really responsive. Um, so yeah, uh, if anybody has questions about health pathways, uh, isn't sure about it, um, please contact our team. We'd be happy to organise either some education for your practice or um, uh, you know, anything that assists you in using the pathways. Um, and that's very brief presentation, Susan, because I'm sure everybody would like to finish up. Thank you, Martina. We do have one quick question again, um, asking username and password. Ah, okay. So for, um, if you use connected and healthcare, um, for both of them or the Southeastern Sydney uh, specific ones are, SE Sydney and then healthcare. Um, so thank you for asking. 